Hello, my name's Ian McMillan, and welcome to a brand new series called the Antiques Treasure Trail, in which me and antiques expert Maurice Goodlad attempt to turn a house into a home. This house here. On occasions, we are unashamedly going to be looking for bargains, and then we're going to treat ourselves as we delve into the expensive end of the market, even if it's only to dream. John. Nice day. John and Jill have just bought this house in a small village called Thornley Dale in the middle of the North Yorkshire Moors. Their aim is to move in in six months' time, which gives us plenty of opportunity to uncover the types of antiques they're looking for and put them into storage. There really is a lot of work to be done. But we're going to start off particularly by focusing on the kitchen and the dining room, aren't we? That's right, yes. We'd like you to, you and Morris, to, to look around and see if you can find us some things which really make the place from a, a house into a home. It's just like Christmas, this, isn't it? Although chaos theory still operates throughout most of Midstream Cottage, John and Jill take one of the first opportunities to unpack some of their cherished possessions, some of which we've found so far on our trail, turning their house into a home without costing them a fortune. In the middle of the Herefordshire countryside, competing with the sound of the birds and the bees, comes the sound of hammering. In a place as tranquil as this, it's easy to imagine uncovering pockets of history, and it's easy to appreciate the desire to collect items from the past. But in Puddleston, there's a man persuading you to first attack your antique furniture with a hammer and chisel. Courses have been running here for some 12 years. You can either come here for two days or for a full week. And under Barry Honeybourne's expert guidance, you're encouraged to bring along antiques from home, whether it fits in a plastic bag or on a roof rack. It's an invitation open to anyone with a love of furniture. OK, wrap it. I've had people from every profession, um, lots of retired people or semi-retired people, lots of people who've been made redundant, lots of people who want to get away from the rat race, to have a new profession, uh, come on courses, lots of people who've got their own furniture who feel that they would enjoy restoring it, they come as well. Lots of people come uh, for several times. I get friendly with people, they come on a course and um, we strike up very good relationships. This is my second course. The first course I came along because we, my wife and I, bought a card table 25 years ago, which was always pleasant to look at but could never be used because the veneers had failed. Uh, and we were ashamed of opening it up. And uh, the object of the course, once uh, uh, I'd heard about Barry, was to uh, see whether it could be restored and to see whether I could do it. You know, I would advise people to come on a course because it's going to give you an in-depth as to what you should buy, what you shouldn't buy, what you should spend your money on and what you shouldn't spend your money on. Um, there are lots of things you can do at home on your own once you've had some tuition. Uh, simple things, and then as, as you uh, gain more knowledge, more technical things. So um, yeah, basically there's great scope, and people should. A lot of people are initially worried about coming on a course because they think, oh, it's going to be too difficult for me. But I've never had a problem with that at all. As long as people do exactly what I ask them, go one step at a time. At the end of the end of the week, they've they've produced an amazing sort of piece of furniture, restored. <laughs> Uh, well, now you've stripped the polish off this chair, Victor. We will, um, we will, you've not only stripped the polish, of course, you've stripped all the old grease and all the old muck, which couldn't be saved, because we're, we're into conserving things, but this, this, the polish on this was unsavable, because it was perished. So, if you can remove the tape off the back, which is holding this in position, and then we will wash the chair with methylated spirits, which will neutralise the stripper, and remove any traces of uh, polish which you may well have left on. And then we can get this chair stained with a spirit stain, and then we'll polish it. I think that's the next, you know, okay. next, next move. Well, it started basically from scratch. So there's a chair we took completely to pieces and, and rebuilt. Uh, so there's a lot of basic carpentry yeah. that, that you had to be aware of that, that I hadn't done for a good number of years. And then there's uh, polishing techniques. Uh, find that as the week's gone on, I've been with Barry now, this is my fourth day, 
as the days have gone on, I, I, I've learned more and more. And you don't realise until you, you go back and you start thinking that how much that you have learned. However long you stay, don't worry if you've no furniture to bring along. Barry can also provide bits for you to work on, and there's the opportunity to visit an auction or two. Restoration courses are available throughout the country, and it's worth checking out with your local library as to where there's a course close to you. What do people get out of these courses? I think they want personal satisfaction of creating something, from something that is um, broken and looks beyond repair to something that's a finished article. Uh, people get a lot of pleasure from that, especially when they use it themselves in their own home, because they can look at it and say, oh, yeah, I went and restored that. And uh, that gives people a lot, a lot of satisfaction, you know, creating something from something that was beyond what they possibly thought was beyond repair originally. These edges around this is, is, is what's called an ebony line, stringing around the edge of the mirror, and there's some of that missing. For instance, a little piece missing there. Now, Peter's cut our little piece out of there because it was damaged. He's going to place a new piece in, slightly oversized, and then flush it down. Same thing goes for this corner here, ebony stringing here, which will be replaced. And then, when he flushes it all down, perfectly flat with the background, he will then polish it to match. I do get a lot of pleasure from teaching people, especially when they haven't had any experience of this trade. They come along with a broken piece of furniture, they restore it, and you know, by often you'll say by Tuesday you can see they've got doubts in their minds as to whether they're going to make a success of it. But by Friday when they've done it and it's finished, if they finish it in the week, you know, they're absolutely thrilled. It's thrilling to see, to see you know, the, the look on their face that they've finished that piece of furniture. See, this is a mid 19th century table, early to mid 19th century table, that it's got um, stringing, which is a, a beautiful pattern. But the table does need cleaning, and we'll we'll partially wash the surface with some methylated spirits to remove any grease and dirt. And whatever is discarded. One's been able to get confidence to do things which I wouldn't have dreamt of doing otherwise. One's had the opportunity of using the very best of tools, which are always perfectly sharp and uh, there's great satisfaction in using good tools and uh, the techniques which one had heard about but never faced up to before. So uh, uh, you end up feeling six inches, six inches taller. So and that's how to match it in exactly. Because when this wood originally was, when this piece of furniture was made, this would have all been bright red, but the age has it's, it's attracted a patina and a colour of its, of its own and it's gone this lovely warm brown colour. So it would no good as putting a piece of timber in it that stands out as bright red. We've got to have a pale piece of wood which we can match in. What I'm interested in teaching people is technique. And I want to teach, they're not going to learn polishing in two days. There's no way they're going to do that. But they're going to get the basic techniques which they go away and practice. Now, those people that go away and practice, when they come back, the difference is absolutely amazing. Those people that go away and then come back, say, next year and haven't practiced, they're just the same as they went, well, anyway, would be. But so that's the thing. I mean, people must go away and be prepared to practice and put into action what I've told them to do. In the meantime, our trail took me in search of some toys for Alexandra and Rosie, John and Jill's daughters. Feeling inspired, I knew my daughters loved antique dolls, I came across another of Yorkshire's cottage industries which highlighted the amazing skill of some people. As with the furniture made by the Mouseman of Kilburn, here in York was Victoria Shortle, making dolls that will become the antiques and cherished toys of future generations. This is one of my um, which I've launched this year. She's an Italian-German child called Natale. And it's done in the same principle, just like the old dolls were done, sculpted from a real child's face, and then made into a porcelain piece. So does that mean each 
face as a one-off, or would you make a series of them? I'll make 30 pieces of this particular one, although each one will vary because they're all hand-painted and hand-finished, so you'll never get two that look the same. Tell us about the clothes, because is it right that, that originally dolls didn't have any clothes? That's right. A lot of the dolls uh, that were bought um, right back, they actually just came with a very simple chemise, and the clothes were made by the parents or the grandparents or the nannies, whatever mm. design and style they wanted. And with the clothes, with the dolls that you design, you also design the clothes? That's right, I design the clothes as well, yes. And what kind of materials are you used for the clothes? I like to use natural fabrics, silks, very fine cottons, everything as natural as possible. I'm not into synthetic fabrics. As a child, I didn't actually have that many dolls. I was more into mechanical toys, but now I just absolutely live for dolls. What is it about them that you like? Each one has a character and a story to tell, especially the old ones. They've seen so much, and some of them have had such sad, sad lives, and, and they held such great feelings. The toys that you buy, as, you, may, you may even buy them as an adult, become the heirlooms of the future for your family. Um, personally, I have a teddy bear, which I've had since I was very small, and is very sort of um, holy and um, doesn't look particularly attractive anymore, but to me he's worth an awful lot. And it's also that element of the fact that somebody's loved that at some stage. Probably it's a very well-loved, very dog-eared thing which you're buying, but you buy that sentiment with it as well. And yeah, I think toys are a very good thing to buy that you can pass on to your children and your children's children and are likely to stay in the family probably more than other things do, so very well worth looking at. Yeah. It depends on, on the children to a certain extent. Um, I, I think to buy an antique toy say for 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 your child and say oh, well it's an antique you mustn't ever play with it or you must put it back in the box and be very careful with it because it was worth a lot of money when I bought it isn't the spirit that toys were made it's very nice you know, but I, I feel that toys are there to be played with and to be enjoyed by the children they belong to so far throughout this series We've talked a lot about antique fairs and auctions, and we hope that you're feeling relaxed about going there to buy your antiques. But if you're still feeling a bit wary, there's another kind of place you can go and still feel comfortable about buying antiques, and that's antique shops. If you walk down any street in a city or country town, you're bound to see one or two. Morris has got one in Thornton Dale, but we didn't want to go there because he might go on about how great it was. So we dragged him along to a mate of his in Bridlington to see what happens in an antique shop when you open the doors. I have this shop very higgledy-piggledy and if I have people walking in here that whisper as though they're going into a morgue then I find I start altering it because there's something wrong or I'll draw the people out so they enjoy themselves and you enjoy people and if you enjoy people like Morris does you draw people out they talk and then all of a sudden you start talking about the, the houses the homes what they've got what their interests are and they relax so if somebody was looking for stuff to decorate their house, what advice would you give them if, if they're coming into an antique dealer's? If it's a young family starting off on a very small um, budget and they just wanted to get their new home fitted out with something, um, the 1930s, 50s period is being given away. You can get sets of chairs, tables, 15 pounds, 20 pounds. The shippers buy them at the same price. They could fit their house out for 600 pounds. That's complete with cooker and everything out of a decent clearance. Um, for the more um, astute person that wants it to buy something that is going to go up, small inlaid mahogany, better furniture, but small is, mm. is good. And I guess once you get to know somebody, you also get to know what they want and what... That's right. You, know, you when, get to know the taste. Yeah. A lot of people um, aren't antique orientated, so it does pay to, to um, Foster a, a friendship with a dealer, but beware. I mean, dealers are out to make profits. We're not out to be charities. But there is a balance. The balance is that within two years, you should be making a profit on the item that you purchased. You're obviously going to pay the, the dealer's profit. And so within two years, you can get your money back. And this is where the antique world and the second-hand world beats the, the, the new uh, furniture, because if you pay three to four hundred pounds for a gate leg table that's reproduced brand new, you can go and buy a, a very fine second-hand one for 150. Immediately, you're fed up with it, you can get your 150 pounds back and show, hopefully, a small profit in a, in a year or so. The Antiques Treasure Trail, 
a series that helps you to make money as well. It's almost too good to be true. Now, when you're turning a house into a home, as we are, you can't neglect any room, not even the smallest room in the house. Now, this might look like a pile of junk, but if I rub this down, there's brass underneath. And antique dealers send out bath scouts to look for pearls of bathroom furniture. As you can see, sinks and toilets come in all shapes and sizes. This Belfast sink probably once belonged in a school, and now it might grace John and Jill's house. Most people had a tin bath in front of the fire. It was only in the late 19th century when the middle classes got plumbed in. Like when they're done up. This is an Edwardian vanity unit, it's worth about 500 quid. It's got the original brass taps, because of course in those days all taps were brass. Oh, give me a reclaimed bathroom suite any day. If it's a nice antique roll top bath which gives atmosphere to the house, yeah, go for it. Um, it's actually a place where you spend a lot of time on your own is your bathroom. It's a place where you do to sit down and you do take in your surroundings. So it's quite important that it, you can feel comfortable and lived in. And I think a lot of people, it, they probably decorate their bathroom more than they decorate most of the other rooms in the house. And you do get fed up with your bathroom and the colour scheme. I mean, we've all gone through that avocado and pink stages. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to go back even further than that. Maybe they will come back into fashion, I don't know. But a nice white rolled up bathroom and you know it's nice chrome fittings from the 1930s absolutely lovely and I don't think they will date like the modern ones do so yeah go for it change the surroundings around the bathroom suite by all means but if you invest in that sort of thing then you've probably got something that you're always going to want to live with I've been sent out again without the aid of motorised transport because Morris says I need the exercise to do a bit of detective work I've got to find out why a mouse might be a good thing in the house. But there's just time for a swift pint. It's thirsty work, this antique collecting work. Mind you, Morris told me you never have to do to me collecting antiques. I'm not sure what he means, although I've got a strange feeling that I'm being watched. Traditional tools and traditional ways have been the trademark of the mouse man Robert Thompson for over 50 years. It takes five years to learn the skill of working with English oak and there's pride in the knowledge that you're making furniture that's already found a place in history. But where did the mouse come from? What gave him the idea? Well, the story behind that one is that uh, great-grandfather was working with a fellow craftsman, Charlie Barker, and Charlie happened to mention he thought we were both as poor as church mice. Now, whether that was something to do with the rate of pay that he was being paid at the time or not, I don't know, but great-grandfather thought how alike he was the church mouse. You know, the mouse works away with its chisel-like teeth. Nobody knows it's there. And there was he working away on the edge of the Hambleton Hills, not making a song and dance about it, but with something to show at the end of the day. Founder Robert Thompson will be honoured to know that his traditions continued into the 90s and his furniture will become the antiques of tomorrow. It's been proven time and time again where pieces of furniture that we have made a number of years ago have come up for sale in the sale rooms and they've actually made more than the list price of a new item of furniture on that particular date. So it's nice to know that the items that we're making are appreciated and are collectible and are required by people who, um, who know the value who can also use them as a piece of furniture not just put them in a corner and look at them but it's, I mean, a table like this is to uh, have a meal off at every meal time. And that's uh, the beauty of what we do here at Kilburn. Everything is usable. Mm -hmm. 
We solely use English oak in the manufacture of all of our furniture and everything's produced from the solid. We don't use any plywood, particle board or veneer, but it's all naturally seasoned. We use as a guide for every half inch thickness that the boards are sewn to, it's about a year outside. So something like a tabletop, two inches thick, you're looking at four years sat outside before we even contemplate using it. So it's like whiskey in a way, it has to be aged. The older the better. Now, in my hands, this piece of wood would probably end up on the skip. But in the hands of these craftspeople here, they can end up as excellent pieces of furniture that John and Jill would love to have in their house. And also, would keep for a long time, hand on to their children and grandchildren, as antiques. I think if you know of um, a craftspeople like Mousy Thompson, for instance, then those sort of places, pieces are always going to be relatively valuable because they are exceptionally well made and there is, uh, there is a collectors all over the world that are interested in those pieces. They're never going to date, they tend to remain traditional and yet I think if you can come across a piece like that and you can afford to buy it, it's well worth doing. And also you've got to remember that these people are continuously training professionals in that field to continue to be able to keep that craftsmanship at that level and that's really important. We need to keep those sort of small industries going because without them we would lose a certain amount of our traditional cabinet making and so therefore it's important that people not only look for the older stuff but continue to buy the new stuff because it's the new stuff which is being made at the moment which is keeping people in these trades and becomes the antiques of the future. Now well, first off we uh, screw three of these to a block. One man, now in his 70s, worked with Robert Thompson. Ken Smith now passes his skill and knowledge not only to the younger craftsmen but also to many visitors to the centre in Kilburn. For Ken, there's tremendous satisfaction in knowing that future generations will be able to admire his work. It's a nice feeling, to tell you the truth, knowing that you've possibly made something, it'll be there for ever, more or less, if it's taken care of, same as the old buildings of panellings and oak that's been generated into past historical buildings, and it's still there. Now this is going to be uh, an antique in, in time to come. great-grandfather would be pleased, wouldn't he? I would like to think so. I mean, his last words to my father were, make sure you keep the timber yard full. Well, I hope you've seen that over the next few programmes, we're going to make a really exciting journey through the world of antiques as we try and turn John and Jill's house into a home. And I hope that you'll also feel comfortable about trying some of the ideas out as well. And another giveaway to this, John, if we lean it back, Cracky, isn't that a little bit risky with something no. worth quite so much? No. This, as you lean it back, have a look at the legs. £17.48. £17, uh, bargain. Not bad. Mm. <laughs> so don't rub it. <laughs> <laughs>